Welcome everyone to the Site Selectors Guild webinar. We'll turn it over to Jay Garner for introduction. Thank you, Rachel. Good afternoon. Good day, everyone, from wherever you're calling in from. Um, thank you for attending our third and final complimentary webinar on site selection in a COVID world. I'm Jay Garner with Garner Economics, and it's my honor to serve as the chair of the Guild for this year. Today's session will be moderated by our president and CEO, Rick Weddle. We have three excellent Guild member presenters today. Chris Lloyd, who I want to give a special shout out to. Chris was uh, driving from the mountains of North Carolina back to his home in Richmond, Virginia, pulled over at a outlet center so he could get Wi-Fi just to call in and be part of this. So special yeoman's work for Chris Lloyd. Uh, Bob Hess and Mark Williams are three presenters. I mentioned earlier that this is the third and final complimentary webinar the Guild is offering. We offer these as an appreciation to those who have participated as a sponsor to one of our conferences, a sponsor of one of our advisory forums, and for those who attended a past Guild conference. As part of our new business plan, which we call Guild Forward, we have a series of new products we are kicking off in the fourth quarter of this year and in the first quarter of next year. Two of these new products are virtual, a webinar series offered by our Guild members with subject matter and content developed by our members and a virtual take on our popular table talk series from both our annual conference and our fall forum. Our third product um, is not virtual and will be offered in person. We call it One Day, One Sector Sessions, and we will have between four and six guild members present and limited attendance of less than 500 registrants. These will be held in locations around the country several times a year, starting early next year. So stay tuned for more on all these products. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Rick Weddle. Thank you, Jay. And I'm pleased to be the moderator uh, of today's webinar. This important discussion on the changing landscape of corporate location strategy and site selection during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, today's agenda will have a robust discussion beginning with uh, the uh, presentation of our most recent Guild member survey uh, conducted to get a, a feel for trends and conditions during the COVID-19 pandemic presented by Chris Lloyd with McGuire Woods Consulting and Jay Garner uh, with Garner Economics. We'll also move from that into the changing landscape of site selection, a very interesting point and counterpoint discussion. Uh, the urban perspective presented by Bob Hess with Newmark Knight Frank and a suburban and rural outlook, a little different take from Mark Williams uh, with Strategic Development Group. A little housekeeping before we get started. If you have your GoToWebinar control panel uh, on your screen, you'll notice a chat box in the lower or bottom section of it. Uh, if you will use that chat box to submit questions to me, uh, I will then curate those questions and uh, try to make sure that time permitting, we get everyone's question answered during the Q&A session at the end of the panel discussion with our panelists. The, the webinar today will last one hour and we'll try to end promptly on time. So without further ado, let me turn it over now uh, to Chris Lloyd uh, with McGuire Woods Consulting to go over the beginning part of the summary of Guild Member Survey. Great. Thanks, Rick, and uh, appreciate uh, everyone making time to join us today. Excuse my uh, casual atmosphere here. Uh, as Jay noted, I'm coming back from the in-laws, and our schedule got bumped around because of lacrosse practice for our daughter last week, so I'm coming back a day later than I expected. Uh, but if you look around, uh, you can see retail is alive and well despite the uh, COVID crisis. Uh, the parking lot is here, here is full, and I think that uh, also plays into some of the topics we're going to talk about later. 
Um, we'll start with what y'all will recall that right when the COVID crisis hit, uh, the Guild surveyed its members to ask uh, them what they were hearing, what they were seeing in the marketplace from their clients uh, and how that was impacting economic development. And we provided an earlier seminar and ran through that. We thought now that here we are a few months in, uh, actually a lot more months in than I think all of us thought we would be and still be dealing with this, uh, but thought it would be important to update uh, all our sponsors and those who've been so good, uh, such good partners to the Guild on again, what we're seeing as Guild members uh, among our clients with regards to economic development. So the first slide we've got here uh, shows that we still, uh, when you survey the Guild, we still see a great volume of projects moving forward. You see 61% uh, of the of, of Guild members say that their clients are moving forward with site selection projects. Although you're seeing you know, some weakness that people are saying uh, that companies are uh, either putting projects on pause uh, or some projects altogether are being canceled. Uh, I know, I, speaking of our own business, we've seen we have do a lot in the hospitality space. A lot of those projects have just been canceled completely, whereas others are either being paused or people are still moving forward. So it really is, I think there's, there's good, strong activity that's out there, and that's what we're seeing. Uh, and I think we should all take heart in that, the, uh, that despite us being in this crisis far longer than we thought, that economic development activity is remaining stronger. Next slide, please. What we then asked the Guild members to, to look at was, well, when do you think we're going to return back to maybe not normal, but when are we going to see strength again in the marketplace? And you'll see, you know, we already had some deals that were happening in the spring, but you'll see, uh, at least among the Guild members, that really nobody thought this summer was going to be uh, hardly anything. I, I think that's a little bit of a, uh, uh, not exactly accurate, because I think there's a lot of kicking of tires. There are projects that are being announced around the country. Uh, but it's certainly not a whole lot of new activity being initiated. But people really see a resurgence this fall and winter uh, and certainly in the next year in the return to activity. And I think that's uh, good uh, for the industry and good for us to be looking forward going forward. Next, what we're going to look at, the next slide, is where are we seeing some of the activity? And, and, and some of that activity you're seeing manufacturing uh, has not been necessarily slowed by the pandemic because those are projects with a very long lead time. Uh, you know, years in the making, not just months. So projects that were already in the pipeline uh, are still going forward because companies are looking forward to not just what's going to happen next quarter, but they're trying to figure out what's going to happen three, five, ten years down the road. So you're seeing strength in those markets, um, in particularly in manufacturing. Next slide, though, we'll also look at, well, where do we think activity will occur? Uh, and this is why we wanted Bob and Mark to be speaking later about what we're seeing among the Guild is this potential shift to suburban markets um, and away from urban areas. And I think we'll have some very interesting discussion uh, about that, that, you know, as, as people continue to have seen has, uh, how the COVID crisis has unfolded, uh, they're seeing not just the COVID issue, but uh, they're seeing um, social unrest and other issues in the coastal cities and large urban areas. I think that's influencing and starting, really starting to have an impact on corporate decision making. Uh, and so we'll get into that point a little bit more when Mark and Bob speak. With the next slide, uh, you'll see we are talking a little bit about that, uh, at least the Guild, when we did the survey, said that they saw less demand for traditional office space uh, as more uh, people work from home. Although you're starting to see some people questioning that. I'm seeing it in our client base that people are saying, yeah, we might have more remote work than we did going into this crisis and more opportunities for people to work from home. But I think people are starting to realize, hey, when you're not in the office, you're losing some productivity. You're certainly losing out on corporate culture. So, you know, the real estate market is all over the place, whether this, uh, this shift to, uh, to work from home is permanent and how big of an impact it'll be. Next, uh, we asked the Guild members to, to say what cities, particularly since we saw this shift to suburban and mid-sized cities in our polling data, we asked them, and we, this was a, a wide open question that was asked, we didn't provide uh, cities uh, for the Guild members to respond to, to ask them where they thought they were gonna be, where they saw a lot of new projects heading. I won't read the list, it's fairly self-explanatory, but I think there's you know, five characteristics that you see in common when you look at that list. First, most all of these markets already have and continue to have a healthy, speculative office and industrial development uh, marketplace already going on, meaning that the institutional investors and local investors were already developing product in that market. There's a lot of product that's available uh, for, um, for new growth in the future. They're not, there's not a tight supply. Uh, and so new product is coming online, uh, particularly in the office market. Second, if you look at a lot of these markets, they are still proximate 
to other large metro areas. So Reno really is a proxy for people getting out of the Bay Area. You know, the, 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 the um, South Carolina sites are a proxy for, for an Atlanta or some, some of the other larger metros. Not that those metros are gonna do poorly, but there's still, you'll see still some clustering around, there's still some proximity to large metro areas. Third, almost all of these communities have either a strong university or a very strong retail, I mean, retail um, research presence. You know, there's a large medical company or medical supplier who has a very strong research presence. So they are an attracted, a magnet for talent. Fourth, you'll notice all of these are non-coastal communities. They're all interior communities uh, to the U.S. And again, I think that goes to some of the issues that I talked about earlier. And fifth, almost all of these communities have a very well diversified economy. They're not overly dependent upon one sector. Uh, they have a very good blend already. And I think people are seeing uh, the opportunities to grow in those markets uh, as we get out of this crisis. The last slide next, before I turn it over to Jay, next slide, yeah, is uh, where we still think that the most active industries are gonna be. And you'll see again, biotech and life sciences, uh, res, uh, res, everybody sees a lot of activity there, particularly with the onshoring and the potential for federal incentives to encourage companies to come back into the US uh, to manufacture um, uh, medicines and drugs and pharmaceuticals. Advanced manufacturing, again, some of that onshoring effect there. Food and beverage has remained strong throughout this crisis uh, and was already a growing sector anyway. Transportation and logistics, uh, you know, to support a outlet center like I'm at now, retail is uh, coming back uh, pretty strong. And, and of course, e-commerce uh, is very strong. So a lot of projects in transportation and logistics. And then 31% said they thought software and IT, uh, whether that's to support uh, remote working uh, is, is a growth area. Although interestingly, the Wall Street Journal had a story the other day that surveyed a number of the uh, IT companies who said they were holding back on adding new jobs because they just weren't sure exactly what the new return to work atmosphere is gonna be. And with that, Jay, I'll let you finish up some of the other issues with regards to perceptions and what uh, site selectors and others wanna hear. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, thank you, Chris. So we asked our guild members, what do we think are the key priorities for you as economic development professionals and practitioners and how best to uh, promote, enhance the economic vitality of your respective geographies. So what hasn't changed from our previous surveys is still a, a concerted effort on business retention, but look how they're all grouped together. So business retention, talent development, talent attraction, and very importantly, you know, part of my mantra of no product, no project, and that is product improvement. What are you going to do to make sure that uh, you're not selling from a, from an empty uh, wagon? Obviously, business attraction is extremely important. And the reality of it is that, especially with a number of small businesses, small businesses are being decimated by COVID and the pandemic. And so, Economic development practitioners are going to need to do what they can to rebuild uh, the pie, to bring that business opportunity back into their respective geographies, which is done holistically from recruitment, retention, and entrepreneurship. So what we're saying in this survey is do not give up on business attraction because it's a key component of diversifying your economy, especially since a number of businesses are gonna close. Next slide. So what do we wanna hear? Well, it's all about um, finance, talent, uh, and product. That's the key. So how you communicate that, either through social media, through direct outreach to guild members, uh, however you feel it is best, to engage your vast and different and diverse audiences you need to do. But remember, it's about your workforce, it's about your finance opportunities, which includes incentives, and it's about your product. Next slide. So to sum it up, we have this on our uh, website, siteselectorsguild.com, with a narrative associated with the infographic that you're seeing. So I would encourage you to look at, at uh, this page on our website to see more about what Chris and I have discussed. We will be updating this survey work 
periodically. So stay tuned for that. It will probably be part of one of our upcoming future webinar series. With that, if you will, turn to the next slide. I'm going to turn it over to Bob Hess, who will talk about the urban perspective in the site selection framework. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate that. And thanks for putting my high school picture in the presentation there. Um, so it's, it's great to virtually see you all. Um, Right now, I would have everybody in the audience say, can you raise your hands about who works in an urban or suburban or rural environment? I can't do that. So, uh, but I'm sure you're all from these different uh, geogra geographies right now. So welcome to the, to the session. It's just not that simple, the location algorithm. And uh, that's the start of the viewpoint. I'm gonna be giving you the viewpoint on the urban side of things today. And the question is, is what is urban? So three mindsets on this algorithm right now. One is the, the frozen, the fear, the perilous, people that are in survival. You know those industries, hospitality, retail, et cetera. Then there's a lot of opportunity-minded folks out there looking at this algor location algorithm right now. They see value when we talked about those industries and Chris did a great job at talking about those services. They see green shoots coming out. They're doing scenario planning right now in the boardroom, absolutely. And then there's the needle movers, the first movers. Some, some areas in tech, some M&A, some developers positioning themselves. Those are the three mindsets uh, that I'm seeing in the marketplace right now that'll impact my discussion on urban. Next slide. So the question is, is what is urban? And uh, so are we talking about a CBD or a downtown or are we talking about high density uh, locations? Uh, a lot of people are gonna go right to New York, San Francisco and Chicago, right? Maybe Atlanta right away on urban or by the way, Houston, does Houston actually have a downtown? I mean, it has lots of different nodes, right? Austin, uh, you know, the, the whole issue of Plano and Frisco relative to Dallas, they've been the benefit of a lot of projects. So the whole question of what's urban or an urban setting is something just to keep in mind, definitions are important. But I just thought I'd put this framework up there. Uh, it, it illustrates why it's not that easy. So uh, so looking at whether something's gonna be urban or suburban, you know, we. My practice and our company spends a lot of time in urban areas and there's a framework for this. We bring this into meetings with our clients and we talk about testing a situation. So if it's a financial services firm who is very innovative and wants to be FinTech and they want a headquarters and they want to have a major airport, are they going to be in the urban core, right? Or is that an ecosystem or a cluster? Are they an innovative company? Is it going to be a cost effective location that might say, well, let's look at edge cities or suburban areas. So it's just not that simple. You really got to think about this model and culture and innovation, financial strategy set the stage for this geography discussion we're going to have today. Okay, next slide. So the viewpoint on urbanization right now is, you know, urban core, is it dying? Is it called reverse urbanization or is it urban jobs Armageddon? I mean, you're hearing a lot, right? You're reading a lot, um, you know, the next seven, seven minutes, I hope to like put some perspective around that. Urban Urbanization is not dying, but there's a new lens on it right now. Per, there was pervasive urbanization. Read all the Brookings Institution, we've all been involved with that. But that historic link of where we work and where we live is tenuous now, it is changing. And there's a lot of learnings coming on about workforce mobility, different models, rethinking, reimagining, and workflow and productivity. Um, and there's opportunity-minded organizations that are looking at that right now. So somewhere around four, four and a half percent, five, three, they say people work from home right now. Uh, some people are saying, hey, it's going to be 50 percent. Some say it's going to be 100. I'm going out there and giving you a prediction. I think it might double, but we're not talking about 50 percent working from home long term. In the short term, there's lots of interesting set strategies. Yeah, Facebook said 50 percent, right? That's an ur Is that an urban company, by the way? They're on campuses. Is that urban or high density area, right? So uh, at an engineering firm that I'm working with down in Texas, they were 100% in the office, never could go anywhere, blueprints. Now that COVID's come, they are 80% work from home forever, the CEO said, according to our last interview. Different mindset, mindsets, different lenses, right? And it's gonna be tech versus IT versus you know, there's some companies and industries that are regulated. So this number is all over the place. And I'll end this slide saying we're in the third inning on this, not the ninth in terms of what's going to happen with work from home, people, talent, how it's going to impact urban versus suburban. Next slide. Uh, landlords are really looking at this, right? The right geographies, where they're going to invest. Capital markets are pretty active. So every week I'm on a call with 
our top of capital markets and brokers at Newmark. And there are some of them that have, they're very liquid, uh, they have resources, and they're looking at parking that in certain urban areas, even suburban areas, in terms of where they're going to invest and change their assets and a different play in terms of where they're going to put their money. That's a very big factor right now, the landlord versus the occupier, right, and the geography. And new designs are coming in all over the place, from the front door to the elevator, the lobby. Um, it, it's, it's just amazing right now, but it's still about the talent access seeking, securing it, developing and retaining that talent. And I think the FANG companies are a good example there. Facebook, Amazon, Apple, you, you, you know what that is. Tech industry is a good part of talking of this, this urban versus suburban. It'll change, let's say for manufacturing, by the way, uh, in Chicago right now, they've created a new law called scheduling. Manufacturers are leaving Chicago in droves because scheduling and minimum wage types of things. So by the way, there are urban manufacturers in big cities. Now, what are they gonna do? Okay, well, I mean, that's just, everything is being looked at in a different lens right now. So, next slide. So, never mind what I think. Uh, so, I went out to some of the top uh, urban core brokers in Newmark. I surveyed 25 people in their industries, and this is some of the comments. I'll let you read them. I find them pretty interesting. One of the things when it comes to urban versus suburban right now, or urban settings and suburban areas, is public transportation. Look at that comment about the Bay Area Caltrain ridership, 3%. Uh, I mean, that's just incredible. Um, uh, you know, when is it going to be safe? A uh, mental health benefits. Uh, so when you talk about urban industries, urban tech, you know, urbanization of industries where they spend their time, investments, these soft factors are really coming into play. And of course, the safe, reliable vaccine is going to set the stage for when they come back, when this percentage is going to change. It's like a spectrum, right? back and forth by industry, what they do, their workflow, the landlords. It's again, back to this concept, if it's a giant algorithm, some people are starting to figure it out. Some are saying are like in the first inning, some maybe you're in the eighth inning. So very interesting comments there. Next slide. You know, maybe this is a biased pers perspective. If I talk to urban core brokers, um, you can read some of these here too. Long-term, the same thing. They wanna be in a high energy area. They wanna be where the action is. And by the way, when we talk about urban core versus suburban or rural, uh, what about the age of the workforce, the demographic? Um, you know, a lot of urban areas have more millennials, Gen Z, Gen, you know, all the uh, different types of talent types and where they live, the housing side. So again, to throw that in there is another variable to look at. I wanted to share this with you. You're all familiar with Zillow. So there's the renter side of being an urban core is a workforce renters. So renters are increasingly choosing suburban living over urban areas. Why? They're back with the family, right? <laughs> they can't afford some of the apartments. They lost their jobs. So maybe it's temporary, 12 to 18 months. Will they come back? This is in 34 of the largest markets. And it certainly has hit New York and San Francisco and Dallas and places like that. But is that going to stay forever? So again, is Armageddon, urban, urban uh, job change, totally reversed? You decide. Next slide. And uh, here's, a, here's a comment. One thing that we're seeing right now is business continuity centers. Uh, this is one of our top brokers in our company who does roughly about $15 million in commissions every year. He works for all the major New York City firms. And this is his perspective. I'll let you read this. Um, but this is really interesting in terms of they might have a suburban short-term strategy called business continuity centers where you could be near that workforce that's in the suburban area, have, have them a place to go where they can have meetings, before they return into urban mass and transit and have to deal with all those issues. So again, lots of different strategies, different industries, talk about geography, what's the definition of urban versus suburban. And then the last thing, we are seeing this movement from high cost centers to low cost centers. And COVID-19, uh, I was chided the other day saying that COVID-19 has only accelerated this trend that was there before. I would say it's advancing or continuing. And uh, we have two projects right now, two HQ2 projects that want to leave big cities like San Francisco, New York, with roughly 750 people. And they want to look at these new remote markets with new ways of working in parallel to that move. So pretty interesting. And the last slide I want to share with you on the perspective of being an urban, looking at the urban side is um, these, the qualitative factors are just being highlighted. Um, FOMO, here's a new term for you all out there. FOMO is fear of missing out. So if you're not in the urban core and you're on the talent side, are you missing out on that energy and being in some of these cities that are thriving, the tier one and the tier two and the tier three cities in urban areas, health and wellness and safety and crime? 
They've always been there. They're going to be accentuated more in the news, right? Diversity and inclusion, social justice. Is that a real critical location factor? Uh, we think it's going to be emerging more and more moving forward. Infrastructure, um, housing. Think about San Francisco and other big cities and urban areas. What are they doing on housing so they can have that diverse workforce? And then all these issues of master planning and zoning and smart cities and equitable cities. These are all the issues that are coming up. And uh, to quote Richard Florida, and I don't like to do that all the time, but he has some pretty good stuff out there about the future of cities. The crisis may provide a short window for our unaffordable hyper gentrified cities to reset, rethink and re-energize their creative, creative scenes. Keep an eye out for that. Will they really use this as an opportunity to make the city stronger and make a better business environment for jobs and people, assets and organizations? So that's my perspective on urban versus suburban. I'll turn it over to my friend, Mark Williams. Mark? Thank you, Bob. Uh, good to be with everybody today. Uh, my topic has to do, uh, as a follow-up to Bob's, what about the suburbs, mid-sized cities, uh, rural areas? What's the impact of COVID been here? What, what are we seeing as a business as Jay and Chris reflected on what the Guild overall is seeing. And I don't, I don't think you can talk about uh, the prediction unless we reflect for just a second on all that's happened in the last nine months. I mean, if we were sitting in December of, of, uh, December of 2019, I mean, we, we had a, president, a presidential election coming that's still coming that has slowed some things down. We were 125 months into a recovery. Uh, which uh, for me at least was hinting a recession was coming. I was actually wishing for a, for a bit of a recession to, uh, uh, along with the presidential election, to, to have this correction and move on. We were still having discussions about NAFTA or what was going to happen. We'd been involved in, in this tariff war for quite some time in December of 2019. We had a massive worker shortage. That's all we were talking about with our clients or a major topic with our clients is, is a worker shortage. Uh, one of the most fascinating things about December 9, 2019, I remember, and it was highlighted by a podcast with, with Chris and Rick, was sort of the attitude toward incentives and economic development professionals at that time in this 120 some month recovery. You know, do we need incentives? Do we need active recruiters? I mean, that was the time then. Then fast forward uh, to to this year. Uh, you know, we just we just had a, a, a on an annual pace of uh, a GDP decline of 32 percent. Uh, the market dropped 34 uh, percent in just a month or two, but it's recovering. We've injected new concepts into what we're talking about. Uh, onshoring, as Chris mentioned, or reshoring, as many refer to it supply chain risk, uh, high unemployment. Nine months ago, we, we wanted to find people. Now, what, what, what are we gonna do with these people and how are we going to retrain them? So that's been the environment in this nine months. And then what I'd like to talk a little about is how I see that impacting some specific business sectors. Uh, and, and I like to go through those in the lens of, of the suburb suburbs, mid city, uh, rural areas. Uh, Bob mentioned uh, regional HQs or, or HQs. We've been active in the headquarters business uh, as well, not as much as Bob, but we've we've probably you know located 3,000 jobs or so in those sectors in the last five years. And I think the survey may hint that my God, there's going to be this massive change related to moving from these urban cores that Bob's referring to into smaller, mid-sized cities. And, and my contention is that was already happening. That was already happening in, in Tucson and Raleigh and Nashville. Uh, I think it will continue because of COVID. Uh, I think there'll be less emphasis uh, of, of some in big cities, maybe their uh, transportation issues or, or other issues that make it easier. But in terms of, of locating those types of businesses, principally in mid-sized suburban areas, that was going on before. And I think it's going to accelerate even further, but cost remains the issue uh, in functionality and in a, in a more regional focus. That was all there, that's all gonna continue. 
it may continue and accelerate a bit, uh, but it, I, I don't forecast this massive exodus. Uh, advanced manufacturing is similar. Um, we never didn't see a whole lot of manufacturing in, in uh, very urban areas, uh, typically moving uh, to the outskirts of, of suburbs or mid-sized cities where logistics and workforce was there. Um, I th that will continue. Uh, in some cases, it may be in rural areas, but in, for the most part, a, a quest for human talent and logistics and other things that make advanced manufacturers successful. Now, what does COVID do to that? Does it accelerate it? Well, maybe. Uh, maybe, uh, as Chris referred to a minute ago, uh, in medical supplies or uh, defense-related items or others where, where the U.S. government is actually taking an active role in identifying certain manufacturers and trying to bring them here. So maybe COVID will result in more of those locations in mid-sized areas and, and rural areas. I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. Um, heavy and process manufacturing, these guys were go, gonna go where they were gonna go, uh, in my view, before COVID, and they're gonna go where they're gonna go after COVID. Uh, if you're a chemical plant, you need certain feedstocks, you need certain electrical supply, you need barge, you need rail, um, and you don't need a lot of people. So I, d I don't see uh, a lot of change there related to COVID. I think that those projects are, are driven mainly by logistics, mainly by specific site assets that they've got to have and they, they you know, they're, they're going to find them. Um, distribution, uh, quite, quite a lot of change there in terms of logistics uh, that you've heard. I mean, there are uh, so many leads that we're seeing now that we didn't see before uh, that are related to logistics, that are related uh, uh, Jay, I think mentioned food and beverage. I mean, we're we're, we're seeing those those kind of projects uh, at a much greater rate than we did. So that will likely impact uh, mid-sized areas and and uh, and and some rural areas if they have the logistical access. So sort of to summarize my thought on the impacts on on these particular sectors, I think COVID's going to have an impact. I think work rules are going to change. There's going to be a tendency to try to spread people out in the workplace. I expect that, but I don't see a massive exodus out of urban areas. I see probably a continuation of trends that already existed, uh, but maybe with a bit of acceleration to them. So what are some conclusions? First of all, I think it's it's great that we're trying to project what's going to happen over the next year, and everybody wants that but business hasn't reached equilibrium yet. So we're, we're still figuring this out, all of us. We're talking to our clients every day, which is maybe the value we bring to you. That's all we do is talk to our clients and what drives their, their interest in certain areas and their concerns, but we are nowhere near equilibrium here. Um, they're gonna be winners and losers, and, and we're seeing that. I mean, if, if you're in a alcohol business, uh, Many of these people are looking for a place to, to build facilities. You can call them manufacturing facilities. There are many of those projects, food distribution, that's going on. Certain household goods, whether it's uh, mattresses or exercise equipment, there are a lot of projects that have emanated from a COVID environment. Um, so some, some of that's good, and they're losers. Man, parts of the real estate market are, are losers. Uh, we do a lot of work in the automotive industry. Wow, that's tough right now. It's been tough. It was tough with tariffs and it continued to get even tougher with COVID for, for a lot of reasons. Um, but I think overall suburbs and mid-sized cities and rural areas are gonna benefit overall from this as, as a summary. It's gonna be slow, it's gonna be well thought, and it's not gonna be some massive exodus of change. I think something I'd like to leave you all with that I hinted that a few minutes ago in the December 19 scenario, and maybe some were thinking economic development wasn't so important anymore. 
I think right now economic development is the most important thing there is. I think the professionals in that field are the most important people we have in this country right now because they have to continue to sift through how businesses are, are thinking about things, what the assets of their communities are, which of these businesses will be attracted to their assets as they try to align themselves to changes that may be related to COVID or tariffs or other things that are going on. So a very important group of people uh, that, that I hope and advise to, to, to figure out what your assets are and figure out who in this new environment is a winner if you're in a recruiting business. Uh, and there are quite a few of them out there. And if they're aligned with your assets, they make excellent targets. I guess another thing that's on my mind is what do we do with all these people that, that are unemployed? How does that work? How does that impact training pro programs? How does the economic development community seize this opportunity to retrain and, and set a new situation where uh, they're more attractive for business? Uh, and we've got a whole group of people that may have been on the lower end of the the wage and skill scale and use this time as an opportunity to improve that. And um, I'll just leave with one thought. I, I think uh, this COVID situation for all of us, I mean, I know some people have had personal loss and I'm, I'm very sorry, um, but I think from a business perspective, we all, the economic development community, the site selection community, we're all gonna come out of this better. We just have to keep thinking about where the opportunities are, how to seize them, what assets we have to do that. I think urban, uh, suburban and mid-sized communities are gonna do better. Uh, and I think rural communities to a certain extent will too. So with that, Rick, I'm gonna let you take it from there. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I, uh, what, a, I, what a great set of uh, information and content. Uh, one of the housekeeping items that I missed, I forgot to mention, was that this uh, web webinar is being recorded and it will be uploaded to our website and it should be available uh, for you no later than sometime tomorrow. So that was one of the questions, it was one of the first questions that was submitted. Uh, another question to get really, one of the tougher questions was whether or not Chris is actually getting lunch at the subway. That was a question uh, uh, or or, uh, or or maybe what kind of sandwich you are getting, I guess, is the question. Anyway, seriously, we really want to appreciate. There we go. <laughs> Little, there, there's economic development happening right before our very eyes in that. Uh, here's another question about um, that I think is really interesting. And Chris, maybe you want to take it and then we'll go to anyone else uh, that wants to comment. Does projects moving forward mean pulling the trigger or is it just moving through the process? I'd, I'd welcome everybody's thoughts on that. But I, what I'm seeing in my business, what I'm hearing from my, my colleagues is it's both, is some of it is projects truly moving forward to execution, meaning, you know, closure, and then a lot of, you know, exploration. I see a lot of clients just kicking tires right now uh, and wanting to be well positioned uh, once the once there's a little bit more certainty about where the timing and uh, all the recovery is going to be. But I'd like to hear everybody else's thoughts as well. Sure. I, I, I'll, I'll comment, Chris. Uh, we've had a, probably two different kinds of clients in this environment, uh, maybe three, some that were on pause, uh, some that canceled, but there's a, a fair group that's proceeding. Uh, and these are generally bigger projects uh, that are taking place over multiple years in terms of a build out. Uh, one of our clients is, is going to announce a, a half billion dollar project in the next week. I mean, we, we're so, and we've we've got a couple of other larger ones. So it's a mixed bag, right? It's 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 a mixed bag. But for us, it's strangely been busy at this yeah. point. I'm not sure about our backlog, but it's been real busy. I'll comment on that too. Uh, I, uh, we're seeing our clients add an extra step into the process, the go, no go. So they'll start the process, screen opportunities, look around for their, so they want to, they want to position themselves they are looking around, just like the survey said, but there's all that all important business case that seems to get more scrutiny about where they're going to spend their capital right now in COVID-19 
we're trying to get the CFO's time when he's working from home. We're getting people together online. So there's a little bit of delay there, but you know, I think that survey is, captures it for the most part with that little, little bit more scrutiny on go, no go. Hey, Bob, I, I think the sector matters too. I mean, there's certain sectors like uh, construction products mm -hmm. that are rolling right along and certain others automotive that aren't. And, and that, that's a big factor. Yeah, some life science firms are like going, let's get project warp speed, right? You know, with the federal government, like now, let's go. Let's find sites and we need manufacturing capacity for vaccines. So absolutely, it changes by industry asset type for sure. Great. Um, let me uh, run this one back to Mark on this. And this is a question. We talked about talent and you talked about rural and suburban and outlying areas. The question is just really straightforward. What does a rural community do to attract populations back in order to grow uh, so they can actually be competitive for these industries? That's a big question. Uh, any comments? So it's the question of, of decades, right? Uh, there's been a lot of population loss in rural areas over the years. And, uh, and there have been some success stories in how uh, rural areas have uh, built a, a quality of life or a certain brand that that attracts new people. And often, frankly, uh, a real opportunity, I think, for rural areas is attracting uh, people that have left with great talent, big, you know, great business savvy to come back and operate businesses. I think that's often a forgotten strategy. Uh, who are the really smart people that left that we can bring back? Um, but I don't think, uh, you know, when you're, you know, you need thousands of, of uh, high tech people, lots of human capital. I don't know, Bob can comment on this. I think it's a bridge too far. I think you got to pick your battles. Uh, but those battles can be won, and, and I think they might accumulate in a positive way. Yeah, I'll use an example and I'll give you a worry on that. That's a great question. And by the way, I'm from a town of 210 people, okay, in northern Wisconsin. And that was a suburb of a town of 30,000. So I, I, I feel for the rural folks out there. I really have a soft heart. And uh, you know, we put a project in Missoula, Montana a year and a half ago. It was, it was a San Francisco, uh, uh, New York consolidation. And the CFO was from that university. So there's the first thing who came from these rural areas, right? And now they've got 150 person uh, tech practice in Missoula, Montana, and they love it there. And they're getting tons of people that want to come back there. So there's hope, you got to understand. And number two, I worry about the, the wealth generators, the people that own things in large urban areas. Those people are mobile. They might go to their cabin and, you know, in the 20,000 person community, you better know who they are and spend time with them. And who knows, they might stay around or they might start something locally and they go back to the urban area. So they track that talent, track those leaders and wealth builders for sure. Hey, just, just a quick thought on that question. I wonder in terms of COVID, uh, I've heard some discussions about, you know, workers maybe leaving the country or executive, you know, they would if they could, but I, I think rural areas are definitely more attractive for a lot of people to work in. I mean, I, I know I work more in rural areas now. Uh, I think COVID has kind of changed how many, many of us, not all of us, many of us can perform our, our jobs. And a lot of times that's at the mountain, at the lake, where, wherever it is. Let me switch gears real quickly if I can. The questions are starting to really roll in right now, so I'm having trouble keeping up with them as fast as uh, as they're as they're coming in but jay let me ask you a question you know site selectors are really the connective tissue between companies and and edos what should an economic development uh, director or economic development office do how should they stay connected to the site selectors during this kind of lockdown this pandemic this new normal that we're in well, the only difference now versus before i mean you know we, we're always asked this question how how is it best that we communicate with um, third party intermediaries, which is what location advisors are? The difference on this one is you don't have the ability to do that face to -face connection like we did uh, so often before. You don't see the fan tours. You don't see the delegations that are coming to places like Atlanta or Chicago 
um, or you know the New York, New Jersey area to make that connection. So everyone is trying to do a Zoom type of meeting, uh, and frankly, everyone I think is just getting um, weary of that. It's just so it, it, it is getting to where when do you stop? So I think a key consideration is do what you always did before as it relates to providing relevant data to your target audience. And so that's everything on talent, when you have an opportunity with product, whether there is a cluster um, or a new park, an office park, an industrial park, a new building that's coming online, just keeping location advisors like us engaged with that information. Good comments. Bob, let me come back to you real quickly. Uh, in your opening comments, you mentioned in Chicago uh, scheduling, a, an issue of scheduling and how that was affecting companies. Could you unpack that a little bit for our our uh, listeners? Uh, what does that mean? Tell us a little bit more about what scheduling is in that in that context. Well, um, hold on a second. Let me uh, illustrate that. So one of my favorite books is called Small Data. OK. <laughs> Here's a good example of small data. You got to do your due diligence. Chicago's new predictable scheduling law was effective July 1st of 2020. It's really new. It requires employers to notify low-income workers of changes in scheduling and applies to a lot of industries. So the ordinance says employers must schedule employees 10 days in advance, rising to 14 days in 2022. So if you're in an industry, you know, these are your scheduling set around your customer requirements, the delivery needs, and the demand side of the equation. Now somebody's restricting that. I mean, I mean that's it's come up, and we have a we have a prospect that's brought it up. Also with the minimum wage. I'm not bashing Illinois and Chicago here, but um, they, they they've done great on other things. But it, these little things mean a lot to companies right now, especially if they're struggling with some demand or, or certain customers. So that's that's what I know at this point. Okay, interesting. Here's a really tough question. I'll just throw it open to anybody who wants to respond. Have any of your clients that you work with or are working with, have they been thinking about eliminating states if they think of them either as too lax or too severe in their public health response to COVID-19? Uh, easy question for everybody. <laughs> I'll, start, I'll start there. Um, we have a big COVID response platform at our company. Uh, we have offices all around the country, and um, you know that that has not come into play. Uh, doesn't mean there's not local uh, regulatory issues and perspectives and what the mayors are doing and how. Uh, for me, the bigger issue there has been what they we've been seeing on television, you know, in terms of crime and social justice and all those types of things. So for me, those those issues have been more of a factor than like oh. This state has got more COVID cases than the other, other than the fact that you can't travel there. So, I mean, that's just my response. Um, I, let, let me, uh, some of that I think is, you know, so, so very subjective because what one person may think is lax, another person may think is too strict. And so um, in the case of the RFIs or RFPs that we have recently responded to, that has not been a data set related to any of our uh, potential clients' must or wants. Now, on the bigger picture, the whole discussion of a state's or a community's business climate mm -hmm. on everything from uh, tax implications to just public policy related to public safety always gets looked at. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yeah, I, we haven't seen it with our clients, but reflecting on Jay's comment, uh, you may recall a good bit of discussion about Fremont, California and Tesla because they wouldn't let Tesla open back up. And I think that was a, a case in point where the attitude of a community might not only impact an existing business, but it might impact others that were looking. How would how, what would the next scenario look like? I'm not saying that was good or bad, but I thought it was a real interesting example. Yeah, and one tag onto that, Rick, if you don't mind. Uh, and nobody can say the Gill doesn't go there sometimes. Other issues have come up with some consumer product firms about the flag issue and some of the stuff we've been hearing in the news. That does come up subjectively and confidentially in the boardroom. It's not in the RFI, just like Jay says. But those are the things that we get asked about. Will it impact our, our business, right? and our workflow and our talent. 
So those are real issues, and you all know that as economic developers, you've seen that happen over the years. Let me throw well, a question. Rick. Go ahead. Go ahead no, the only thing I would add is I think it does go to business climate, and we did have several clients, and it's not because of the COVID restrictions, but the policies that some of these locations have put into place as a result from COVID. And so we've had two of our clients uh, that had significant operations in a unnamed West Coast state uh, that um, when the certain localities put up procedures into place regarding, you know, return to work policies and all, they said, that's it. That's the final straw. We're out of here. So it was COVID induced. Interesting. Very much in the business model thing. Chris, while I've got you in queue, uh, let me throw this one to you initially. It's just a, it's a non-COVID related uh, question, but it's, uh, I think, an interesting one. It's, it's really, it's the, I'm going to paraphrase a two-part question. It's about the Amazon announcement in Northern Virginia and the growth around that. Uh, it was talked about there'd be a lot of ancillary development that would come with that. Uh, have you seen anything? Uh, what's, what's happening related to Amazon around that or anyone else that wants to chime in on that? Sure. I'll, thanks, Rick. I'll start since it's closest to me. Um, the, the development, the Amazon is uh, meeting expectations, if not a little bit ahead with regards to the job creation uh, that they've had. Uh, the project, the, some of their office buildings are under construction actively right now. Uh, so they're fulfilling, at least my understanding from what I see in the media is they're fulfilling all their obligations. With regards to what's happening around them, um, you're not seeing that yet, only because, you know, it's because of the conditions that are going on uh, right now. So I don't think that it's that it's uh, gonna, that it won't happen. It's just that with all the uncertainty in the marketplace right now, um, I think some of that ancillary spinoff benefit is coming on a little more slowly than than had been anticipated. Uh, but I'm not saying that it won't happen. I think it will once you know there's more certainty. Good, Bob. You mentioned uh, in your comments that you think that downstream diversity and inclusion or inclusivity may become a more important site location factor? Yes. Um, what's a good metric for that? How do, how do you measure that? How would a company go about assessing that? Yeah, well, I'll bring up a specific case study. Um, the Alliance Bernstein was a big headquarters move from New York to Nashville. Uh, we, we, we led that move. And uh, can you imagine, you know, New York City and the, the structure of their workforce there and, uh, you know, the type of diversity of their workforce, and then they're moving into other places, you know, that are lower cost. So it's come up in terms of just everything that what diversity and inclusion means. Uh, uh, basically, demographics, race, LGBTQ, uh, lifestyle, all those types of things. Um, and um, you know, actually, there's actually when you work for California companies, they actually have chief culture officers as part of their team. Okay. So um, this this has always been a factor in terms of demographics and the makeup of an area, but now you're bringing it to the next level of diversity and inclusion. And we know that's been accelerated and more companies have that in their mission statement. It's moving into their metrics of how they measure their success. And that goes right back to talent and workforce, right? So, um, you know, there's lots of different factors, all right? I can list 15 different factors that we've looked at when we've, when we've done that. I'd be happy to take questions later on about that, but it's, it's very empirical research. It's not necessarily data you can find out there in the, from the census, right? You got to observe there, go there, and we we're going to rely on economic developers to show us some examples of how companies have embraced that in the area, benefit from it, and then where we should locate to it to ben benefit from that diversity and inclusive attitude in the metros. Good. Here's an open question for everybody. Uh, we we obviously had biotech or life sciences as part of the what you found in the survey would be a opportunity. It's a question about the outlook for telemedicine, uh, whether it can reduce the healthcare gap uh, with regard to the rural suburban uh, uh, issues, or just generally what the economic impact of telemedicine may be. Anyone want to take a cut at that? I will. Um, let's use the state of Mississippi as an example. Uh, healthcare is a big issue for the governor in that state. It has been for years. Uh, so if you go to the, uh, the, the, the the Mississippi Delta, there's a lot of people that don't have access to healthcare out there. So technology is going to be a big part of that. There is a big telemedicine play where you can actually have a physician's assistance that go to churches and gathering places like in the Delta where people can get health checks, right? 
you know, and being able to use technology versus not having at all because they couldn't drive there. By the way, they can't get positions to move out to some of these rural areas. Mm -hmm. That is a big issue, by the way, in rural areas, getting positions to move there, set up, you know, be able to have a robust business. Telemedicine, uh, I, I would be surprised if as long as it's funded and put into the right programs and benefits, it should absolutely explode. It should. It, it is a good thing if it's done right. Yeah, the key on that, Rick, the key on that is um, getting CMS to reimburse um, telemedicine because before yeah. the crisis, you know, Medicaid would not reimburse a lot of telemedicine visits. And that restriction has been waived by a lot of governors and by CMS under this crisis. So if that gets extended, then I think Bob's right that you're going to see it explode. Otherwise, we're going to probably go back. Good, good point. Mark, let me come to you because I know you do a lot of more manufacturing uh, projects. Early on in the COVID-19 uh, issue, there were some outbreaks actually in certain manufacturing operations. Are you mm -hmm. seeing are you seeing companies do anything differently with regard to design of facilities, uh, maybe to make them a little safer from a health standpoint? Well, I think there 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 are two parts of that, Rick. One is what are they doing right now in terms of of adequate separation and, and workplace uh, style. Uh, and, and so there is a vast consulting business that we're not in of advising companies uh, in the manufacturing environment, uh, I assume in the, in the, certainly in the office environment along those lines. Um, you know, the future, uh, I, I, I can't say that we've run into that just yet, uh, but I would think that that has to be a factor in turn. Maybe it's not COVID, but if we have another situation like this where uh, things can be transmitted that are dangerous, that that, that would be important. Uh, I, I think the other interesting thing that this leads to uh, is uh, that I didn't mention, but I think every recession brings more capital intensity and more automation so we're in a recession right now we're going to have that and then if you overlay COVID on top of that um i think there's going to be an even and, and reshoring on top of that an even greater drive for automation so fewer people more productivity greater separation i think we're i, I think we're going to get a real injection of that Good, thanks. We're getting close to the top of the hour now, and so I've got a question here, and we're going to close out in the lightning round, if you will. So we'll, everybody will take it, but I think this is one I didn't anticipate. But here's the question. What do you consider to be the greatest silver lining, parentheses, if indeed there is one, parentheses closed, to the pandemic? So let's take it. Uh, let's go in sequence, whoever wants to take it first. Entrepreneurship. There has been new industries there's been new processes that have developed as a result of covid okay. efficiency i think i think we're going to see all kinds of efficiency whether it's the telemedicine we were talking about or how we work and how we think about that how we fine tune that i think it's going to be a big big winner for us scenario planning is back and better decision making much more holistic and it's more than just about the bottom line that's what I see happening. It got the recession that Mark Williams was talking about out of the way. That probably would have been a, a very slow burn down and a slow burn back. And it's going <laughs> to condense that period that had to happen into a very short period and accelerate a lot of the trends that we already saw coming. There was a comment, uh, not a question, that was submitted that said in response to one of your comments, Zoom fatigue is real. But it wasn't real on this particular webinar because you guys did a great job. Uh, and I want to kick it back to Jay Garner to let him close it out. All right. Well, thank you, Rick. Thank you, Bob, Mark, and Chris. Um, I I agree. Uh, I think um, the the content that Bob, Mark, and Chris offered has been fantastic, and I hope that our our guild friends that have participated in this have enjoyed it. So that was a nice testimonial to hear. So stay tuned. You'll hear you will hear more from the guild. Uh, both on social media platforms and through other ways that we communicate on our different activities where we want to engage you, the economic development professional. So on behalf of the Guild, thank you for participating. We look forward to seeing you sometime in person. Thank you. Thank you all. Take care. Take care.
Good to be with you.